Sujit is here. He's going to talk for 20 minutes or so. Uh, uh, I think essentially about your new book, right? The New Wealth of Nations, which is here. Uh, we're not sure if we have copies outside, but I'm sure you'll be able to get it in the bookshop or on Amazon. Um, and uh, I'll let Sujit tell you more about it and more about what he's talking about. But I, I understand the main thrust is about how education uh, is changing the world. And the globalization of education essentially means the spread of more equality around the world. But uh, Sujit. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, and thank you, Foreign Correspondence Club, uh, for inviting me uh, to talk about the book. I've also been a sort of, uh, I was going to say non-performing, but um, practicing part-time journalist for the last 20 years. I have a column, um, so I, I really like uh, journalism, and I believe that <clears throat> there's no such thing as bad publicity. So read the book, write about it, tell others about it. Well, let me go. Now, the story I have in the book, um, you know, is, is really the, the greatest transformation that the world has ever seen. And as I hope to show, uh, that it's very unlikely that the world will ever see this transformation again. And it has happened in the last 30, 40 years. Let me, <clears throat> you know, let me just go back to 1960, 1970. And, um, you know, at that time, um, <clears throat> I was a graduate student in the early 70s, and what we were taught uh, about economic development um, was the following. There were three major scholars uh, who said that the world as we know it were doomed, and especially in developing countries, and especially Asia. So here I'm speaking the center of Asia, right next door to uh, one of the greatest uh, transformations ever, which is China. And Gunnar Myrdal wrote the book, and he, he got a Nobel Prize called Asian Drama. And in the Asian Drama, he said, Sub-Saharan Africa will do well, and South America, Latin America will do well, but not Asia. And this had to do with what was the conventional wisdom at that time, that natural resources determined incomes, and we knew that the developing countries were poor. He didn't say that they would grow explosively, but basically that Asia in particular was doomed, hence Asian drama. Then we had, at the same time, uh, a great scholar, Nobel Prize winner, who I uh, talk about uh, in some detail in the book, uh, Arthur Lewis, who wrote, who I think is one of the, the greatest economists of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote a seminal article. First of all, to those of us interested in economic growth, he, his book, The Theory of Economic Growth, is an absolute prescient uh, classic. But the paper that got him the most fame uh, and the most rewards was a brilliant analysis as to how the developing countries were doomed. Um, and he was on my thesis committee. Um, and the developing countries were doomed. The article is called Unlimited Supplies of Unskilled Labor, uh, published in 1955, whose basic contention was that, be, that the real wage in developing countries cannot rise above the subsistence level. Because as soon as it rose above the subsistence level, people would come in, laborers would come in, uh, released from agriculture or whatever. And we didn't even think that the agricultural revolution would be as fast as it has happened. That's the, <clears throat> and indeed, um, in, in my book, uh, I talk about how uh, there's unlimited supplies of skilled labor today, completely stealing and borrowing from Arthur Lewis as to why inflation has been dead in the developed world 
uh, and by implication in the developing world, uh, for the last 20 years, um, and that uh, this phenomena is bound to continue using the same logic as Arthur Lewis. The third uh, brilliant uh, economist of uh, the 60s, and he published his book somewhere, 64, 65, Simon Kuznets. And Simon Kuznets, the inverted U curve, the Kuznets hypothesis, the inequality in developing countries was bound to increase first as people got released from agriculture into higher productivity, higher paying jobs in, in industry, and that after the country became developed and he left it open as to when that would be, that you would then find inequality declining in the, uh, in the developing world. So this is, so the received wisdom was that developing countries would have a hard time growing, poverty would be there, and mind you, it was in the late 60s and early 70s that the World Bank uh, under McNamara uh, set up this whole um, huge research program, pioneering research program, on poverty in the, develop in the developing world, absolute poverty, which was um, the first note on absolute poverty by the World Bank uh, was in 1990. Um, and and we'll, I'll soon discuss as to how um, everybody was quite off the mark. So what happened? So we have developing countries will have time growing, um, inequality will worsen, and the world was in for um, absolute poverty, the poor, for a long, long time, as far as the eye can see. Every one of those forecasts has turned out to be, thankfully, phenomenally wrong. And I don't think there is an equivalence uh, of how quickly the conventional wisdom, which was a long-lasting, remember, two, three hundred years wisdom, was upturned in the short space of 30 years. So we need to worry, or we need to think, as to why that has happened. 1960 was the first time that an economist claimed that education actually affected your income, Gary Becker. Prior to 1960 and his seminal, seminal thesis, we all believed it was your contacts that determined how much income you had, and it was um, which school you went to, uh, which part of the elite you came from, how your connections got you the jobs. And mind you, the other side, if you have uh, uh, institutions, et cetera, that um, you know, uh, various, various reasons were offered to explain economic growth and to explain incomes than education. Indeed, post-1960, after his, uh, uh, after his treatise, that people, economists, started looking back at the 19th century on the great fertility transition, the quality versus quantity trade-off of children to explain the great fertility transition in the 19th century in Europe and the US. So, you know, this thing, and when people were writing this, uh, Kuznets and Arthur Lewis, et cetera, Gary Becker's book had just come up. So my book is really about Gary Becker and Arthur Lewis. But we need to recognize that what we have seen has never before been seen, the change. Let me just give you an idea of how much the change is. That <clears throat> you take India and China, and I'm taking the two together for a particular reason, uh, they housed most of the world's poor back in 1975-1980, two very large uh, continental countries, and having something like uh, 45, at that time, percent of the world's population. If you go back, and there's Angus Madison and other people who have um, given us the data, that between 1500 and 1980, China and India's per capita income 
was very similar to each other. And in 1500, 1600, 1700, the per capita income in China and India together was equal to the world average. So they had 45% of the world's population and 45% of the world's income. In 1980, they had 45% of the world's population and 6% of the world's income. When the transformation was going to take place, that was the absolute narrative. These countries were poor, desperately poor. Okay? One chapter in the book has lost in 480 years, gained in 48. By 2028, average per capita incomes in India and China will be equal to the world average. Everything is in PPP terms, will be equal to the world average. I want to ask, did any of us ever think this would be possible? You know, I was at the World Bank writing uh, a report on uh, the challenge of development, the World Development Report. And China had already happened in the sense of was starting to grow, but we were concentrating on um, all the other Korea, how Korea grew, etc., not understanding that the ground would be taken away from underneath our feet. If you think this is conventional wisdom, there is a fantastic um, um, uh, TED talk by Neil Ferguson, and it's called the Six Killer Apps of Growth. And the six killer apps of growth are competition, science, property rights, modern medicine, consumerism, and the work ethic. Six killer apps that define how a country can grow. I don't see education in there at all. Matter of fact, in the work ethic, it's Protestantism, hard work, saving, and then literacy, not even education, just bare minimum literacy as an afterthought has been put in. So my contention is that it is, this is the phenomena. And you know, so one very popular explanation is the institutions. Okay. And that has been one of the favorites of uh, economists uh, who won awards for it, and, you know, just like the others. So I'm not saying um, they did wrong, but it is a very convenient fit to what we didn't know, that is, and what we then projected forward. Institutions, please explain to me how institutions explain China's phenomenal growth. Please explain to me how institutions, the very same institutions we had in India in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, and indeed those institutions have become worse in India. And yet, we have got growth. And we'll continue to get growth. And why? It is because of education. Now, you know, I have spent inordinate amounts of time, too much time, um, in terms of explaining, you know, I have a book in, in 2002 called Imagine There's No Country, and going to the minutiae of measurement of absolute poverty, dollar a day, line, etc. Okay? And going as to how maybe this is not right, maybe that is right, but trying to explain absolute poverty and the reduction in absolute poverty. So one of the chapters in the book has a following, okay? So it is the same definition of absolute poverty, the dollar a day, going back to, 18, uh, to 1850, 1870, and going forward to 2030. Uh, but going forward is not so important. And what, and what we have today is the data for all of these countries by Barrow and Lee uh, as to the extent of illiteracy. So whether you went to school, just simple, what proportion of the population went to school? And if you didn't go to school, you're illiterate. That proportion explains the entire phenomenal growth or reduction in poverty. It's a straight line. Back in 1870, poverty was very, very high. Illiteracy was very high. And one for one, all the years down there, 
So, in other words, it is not just, now you could say it's a spurious correlation, but please tell me, okay, first of all, there is, uh, and one other element about education and the revolution that Becker unleashed. Um, <clears throat> so there were zillions of studies. Everybody was doing a study on the rate of return to education and so on and so forth. And what you found out um, was that each such regression, especially for the developed world, and for the U.S. it was tried first, explained only 7% of the variation in individual incomes. After controlling for age, sex, um, and the years of education, you were still able to explain only 7 and in developing countries, when it was tried out uh, for India, et cetera, the explanation, explanatory power goes up as much as 45, 50%. The point being, it's not as if there aren't other determinants. It is that it is the most important determinant of a person's income. Now, what are the consequences of, um, what consequences can we expect uh, to happen? <clears throat> because of this. One, we've already seen, and this is for the last 20 years and ongoing, about the death of inflation, which is wages. Basically, the big phenomena in the US, etc., and we're all saying about the last seven years since the post-financial crisis as to how wages have not, uh, as to how the unemployment rate has really, really dropped and wages are not going up. But you go back to 1980, 1990, and you find that basic, essentially inflation in the developing world died somewhere around the mid-90s. By de death, I mean 2%, okay? So let's, and I remember when I went to graduate school in the early 70s, 2% was frictional unemployment of people changing jobs, et cetera. So 2% is, is greater than zero, but really is about as close to zero as you can possibly get. That is one consequence. The second consequence, and this is a major, major uh, theme in the book, and which I go ahead and, and test in various ways, is that, and you know, mind you, this book was written before the Me Too movement, before Weinstein, etc., appeared on the scene. The women, because of education, are now going to take over the world, just to put it and paraphrase it a little bit. This is, this has not happened in human history where women are equal to men, and as I'm projecting, perhaps even more equal. Just to give you an idea, Oxford University, a thousand year old university, for the very first time has more women undergraduates than men. Thousand years, this hasn't happened, okay? And you see in terms of test scores, you see in terms of enrollments in developing countries, think about why Saudi Arabia has suddenly woken up and the women can now go and watch a soccer match. This is not accidental. The women can now drive and very soon I would forecast that these. So it is what held women back apart from male prejudice and all the rest of it was that the men had brawn, and the women were, if you will, weaker in that way, had to bear children, and we all lived short lives. And then education started spreading, and the prejudices, etc., continued to go forth, and now there was nothing to differentiate in terms of the labor market, in terms of earning power, in terms of anything that you want to think about between men and women. So this transformation is permanent, is going to even be much more explosive and expand. It is changing the way humans or men relate to women, uh, whether inside the house or in the marketplace, and that is all because of education. There's equality. Talking about equality, let's look at um, about what Kuznets has said, okay, about inequality worsening. Because of education, it turns out that world inequality, so you take the world as one country, and this exercise was done in 2002 in great detail in my book, and it has been repeated, 
world inequality today is at the lowest level since 1870. So you take the World Gini Index of personal income inequality is there. You know, people question, and I'll come soon to a little bit on inequality in the U.S. as to how can that be, you know, uh, what you see is an inequality all around and so on and so forth, the top 1%, and then there's a top 1% of wealth, which I'll briefly uh, talk about. But here I'm talking about income. <clears throat> in because of, okay, let's take every country, they, let me give you a simple statistic which drives home uh, in China and India. Their rate of growth, so just to find out in the simplest way possible without any technicality as to what I'm saying is manifestly correct. China and India have grown at something like 6.5% per annum per capita, and two-thirds of that because of China, one-third of that because of India, but 6.5% per annum for the last 35 years. The Western world, the richest part, these guys, their per capita income has grown by one. This, the poorest guys, and very voluminous guys, 40% of the world's population, have grown in 65 You don't need rocket science. You don't need to get into any complications to know that world inequality is, has really collapsed because of the growth in these countries and other developing countries, and because why were they able to grow? They were able to grow because now they were on the same level playing field as the Western uh, world, uh, education. So the same story which explains the, the transformation the ongoing transformation of women with men, same story is the Eastern world or the developing world or the emerging world with the Western world. It's absolutely the same story. So we've had institutions, you can think back to everything, the six color apps, property rights, this, that, etc. you find that it is not the case at all. They all give, this is the one unifying and which has, I think, uh, a great uh, support conceptually, economically, theoretically, etc., that education is the biggest ever transformer and the biggest ever determinant of growth for the developing countries, and which means 90% of the world's population. Um, so one other uh, minor point I want to make, and this is a little bit about our profession, uh, etc., <clears throat> You know, what sells is, you know, Oxfam, and what sells is Piketty, and what sells is the top 1%, right, have 50% of the world's wealth. Re read any newspaper, especially around January times, etc. Davos, World Economic Forum, top 1% have 50% of the world's wealth. Well. World wealth defined in terms of financial assets, land, not education. So one of the things, and remember for a lot of us, the, the amount we invest in land and the uh, housing and the amount we invest in financial assets also comes about from our human capital, which is education. Um, you know, one way to summarize this, I, I don't know how many of you remember the great line in, um, in The Graduate, um, where, uh, you know, this guy takes, businessman takes Benjamin, which is Dustin Hoffman, to the side and says, I have only one word to say to you, <laughs> plastics. Well, I have only one word to say to you, education. And after that, actually, it's two words human capital. That is what explains the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shoja. And you've, you've managed to leave um, a nice 20 minutes or so for questions. So thanks so much. Uh, uh, you want to stay standing or do you want to sit down? You can probably, can, can, you, can you sit? Uh, up to you. Yeah, up to you. Um, uh, I, I just wave uh, my arm. Yeah.
Um, okay, well, let's go straight into questions. And I've got one that I may slip in at the end, but the lady here, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just briefly you introduce yourself and, and, um, and then ask the question. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful uh, um, conversation talk. Uh, my name is Shirley Lin. I'm at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I also study inequality. Uh, but my question is uh, about what you just presented. Um, it's really rare somebody would say education is the defining factor because there's so many correlations. So um, in the book, do you show how countries that had the same, for example, demographers would say demographic is really the reason. India and China came in with excess population just when the world needed them, and a lot of the other countries have emerged. So do you show in the book how education made a difference for India and China, but for the countries, other countries, like in Africa that had demographic excess, how they could not compete um, using some constants? So oh. that's one. Oh. And going forward, if everyone is so educated now, how could education be the forward defining, you know, it could be another demographic reason. Hmm. Decline of population means no matter how educated you are, you're not going to win. Uh, so that's my uh, question. Okay. Yeah. I'll address the second uh, very, very important um, question first. And so what is 20 years down the line? What are we going to see? And you're absolutely right. Everybody around the world is getting educated, uh, will get educated that what we'll have, and I do discuss this in the book, what you're going to have is that the determinant of your income is going to be your ability, okay? And uh, right now it's education, the quality of education, and let's, because your question is really much broader, we know quality of education makes a difference, and I indeed in all my, uh, in the book I adjust for the quality of education, but that's, uh, the more important is, that the distribution of income will reflect natural abilities. And it, I try and experiment as to measure the, what evidence we have about natural ability, and it may be looking at SAT scores and everything else, it may be the case that natural ability is much better distributed than what we have. So inequality will even um, uh, become less. On the... Um, and on inequality, let me, okay, let me just come to the demographic and other determinants. Look, it absolutely is the case um, that, uh, you know, there are, this is not all the exp explanations. Um, there is a, you know, some countries may not grow uh, at all, uh, some countries may, but the only one factor that the world knows, and we've got a lot of experience with it, is, um, that education is necessary. So I think we've all reached the point that education is necessary. I happen to think that it is also sufficient, but, but I'm leaving that a little open. One other consequence of your question, and which I, uh, there's a long chapter uh, where I address this. <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of talk about universal basic income and stuff like that, which started in, in Switzerland. Um, so that's one factor we kept in mind. We've got technology, we've got uh, robots, etc. cetera, um, that uh, in terms of employment, in terms of income for the large mass of the population, um, it, the old attempts at the welfare order uh, will no longer be uh, sufficient. We'd have to rethink as to how we organize welfare. Um, and by welfare, I mean for the bottom 20% of the population. Um, one other consequence of the emerging uh, new order um, is that, you know, you look at the Charlottesville uh, men, the predominantly men, and you look at the Garrakshaks in India, we have the cow vigilantes um, go around uh, killing people uh, in the name of the cow. Now, <clears throat> Let's, and I, I draw a parallel between the two and say they're the same people. Because what is happening to this sector of the population is that they have lost out in the education sphere. Maybe not as able, maybe they only got a college degree, maybe they're not as smart, or whatever the reason is, they've lost out in the office space, in the workplace, and they are fast losing out at home with women, with their spouses. 
Uh, and this is something, you know, the second part we've never seen before. Even the first part, we've not seen that much before. So it is something that we really, societies, whether in developing countries or in developed countries, have really got to incorporate into their thinking as to how to organize in a world led by a question which everybody becomes educated, then what do we do? And it's not the case that everybody goes educated, everybody will become rich. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, the dem your first question was demographic, other determinants, sure. But uh, it, it gets swamped uh, with this. And, you know, in the early 90s when I worked on the, um, uh, the challenge of development uh, for the World Bank, <clears throat> that I came out partly as a, uh, as you know, uh, I, I told you I was a uh, aspiring journalist, so you like to come up with catchphrases and so. Uh, I came up with three, three sufficient conditions, necessary and sufficient conditions, or maybe it was the other way around. But let me tell you, I, I get confused myself. Uh, but the three conditions were political freedom, economic freedom, and girls' education. So, and at that time, girls' education was a severe uh, abnormal, abnormality in the system. Boys were getting educated, but girls were not, especially from uh, countries like India and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think that still holds true. And the reason I mentioned girls' education was boys were educated. So I, I'm very pleased I thought of it then, and that it has culminated in this book saying that education is it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Jyoti. I probably want to read another. Oh, go yeah. ahead, because yeah. people down the end might yeah. not hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Jyoti from JP Morgan. Um, I, I guess my question is really more on the practical aspect of your theory and um, how you sort of see this theory propagate again, you know, going ahead when policy has very little um, space for education, both in India and China. Not quite sure um, if you're sort of canvassing this theory and what practical um, you know, implications or suggestions or actions do you have to actually you know, get the ball rolling? Um, no, I think um, I, I somewhat disagree. I think policy has a very large space for education, but if you look at India, which is a country where you think about what can be done wrong, we've done it wrong, and we continue to do so, um, that in terms of education, we've got the reservation system. Um, and we've got uh, the hiring of uh, the public sector for education, uh, where teachers don't show up. Um, so, and then show up in the evening to provide tuition uh, to the very same students that they don't show up in, in class to teach. So I think there's a deep recognition um, about the importance of education. We've just done it massively wrong. I can speak about India with great confidence. I, I don't know about China, etc. on this particular aspect. So I, I think policy will have more and more space for education. And I think uh, in countries like India, things will improve. But mm. there is recognition, big, and recognition that things have gone wrong very much uh, in India. So that I can speak with confidence. Thanks. Okay, can I just follow up on that, on yeah. that briefly, on that Indian question? Yeah, um, I mean, you, you, you accused, you know, Gunnar Middle, quite rightly, of, and, and the other economists from the 60s of being... Not uh, accused, but essentially, they, the they, essentially yeah. they extrapolated, and, and yeah. they, you know, I remember they all said that Myanmar and the Philippines would be the most successful economies in Southeast Asia yeah. because they were then the most rich in resources, right? Yes. But um, are you not guilty of also sort of extrapolating... Um, by looking at numbers for, as you, I think you mentioned yourself, you know, people in school. The problem in India, as you've just kind of outlined, is that there are people in school, but they're not getting educated. Isn't that a dangerous way of measuring? And, and aren't we at risk of, of claiming that everyone is getting educated and therefore the world will become uh, better mm -hmm. and, and more equal, um, when in fact, you know, there are people leaving school who are illiterate, innumerate, and so on? Okay. Very good. 
question, and I would uh, refer to Land Pritchard has a review of my book and much the same uh, point, and I completely agree. Um, and in this context, let me, uh, you know, I, I said I, I go to great lengths to measure the education, the wealth embodied in education, and I'll come to that in a minute. But about three weeks ago, the World Bank came out with a big, big report, okay, the changing wealth of or something, the changing wealth of nations, the changing wealth of nations, in which they say, quite politely, this is the very first time anybody has estimated the wealth embodied in education. So I looked at their numbers, and their numbers uh, are that the wealth embodied in education is at, in 2014 is 793 trillion. I have the wealth embodied in education is 330 trillion. What do they do wrong? Precisely, they consider that a person with 12 years of education in India has the same quality and earning power as somebody with 12 years of education in the US. I, on the other hand, being humble and whatever, <laughs> um, I say, I measure and, it and right. for, for, for the economists. Um, you know, there's a method to do it, but Basically, an Indian, to answer that specific question, right now in 2014, an Indian with 12 years of education has only one-fifth the marketable value of an American with 12 years of education. Very effectively answers my question. Yeah. Thank and you And in very China, much. it's about half. It's taken from the PPP uh, exchange rate versus the regular exchange rate. It's a very straightforward calculation. No, no mess. So, Thank you. No, that's, but, that's, yeah. uh, but I still think there's a huge problem in uh, the quality of education, and we need to address it. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. a couple of questions in the middle of the table, on one on each side, I think. Yes, gentleman here, and then on the other side, yeah. This side first, yeah. yeah. Right side, yeah. yeah. Then and my good friend, Don, sorry. Yeah. And I didn't plant any of these questions, so yeah. I'm waiting for your question, Don. <laughs> I believe you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Jay Lee. Uh, I'm an equity researcher at Morningstar. And I had just had a question a little bit tangential to the main topic of education. Um, but what are your views on the forward path of, uh, I guess, women's empowerment, for lack of a better word? Um, because you talked about how education uh, and how the move away from manual labor or fighting wars um, and you know, the increasing uh, lifespan of humans has definitely even the playing field between men and women. Um, but you know, I, I, from the perspective of, um, you know, for example, I look at uh, the, the pushback against women's empowerment in the US right, uh, the election of Trump, for example. Um, looking at Japan, which is already a developed nation, but does not uh, view uh, women's empowerment in the same way that you see in Western countries. Um, and even in China, where after the Communist Revolution, they had a huge emphasis on men and women doing more or less equal work, uh, but we've seen a pretty big retrogradation afterwards uh, you know, as more traditional uh, patriarchal values, values have reasserted themselves uh, in the past, call it 20, 30 years. Um, so, sorry, uh, no. so my, my question is, you know, I agree that the, the, totally agree the playing field has been leveled to some extent, but, you know, I still see that there are some major, major barriers going forward, and mm. I want to get your views on, on, on what yeah. you think the, the path yeah. forward is. No, um, you know, one of the, um, and, and when I gave a talk at Lee Kuan Yew School just a few days ago, I mentioned the following, uh, that, I went to the US in the mid 60s and um, as an undergraduate. Um, and, you know, what I observed, unlike India, which is a really poor developing country, et cetera, um, what I observed that the women in the US were doing everything but professional jobs. So they were either nurses, they were secretaries. They were paralegals. They were not lawyers. They were not doctors. And they were not professors. So look at America today. And I was 65. And we are 50 years later. It's transformed. Um, so why is it transformed? Um, and it is the only thing I can think of is that their education has gone up at the same time as their fertility rates have gone down because of technology, and at the same time, they're not needed for washing this, that, all the technological revolutions we've had. Think of, you know, a Saudi Arabian woman. 
right, has all the money, etc. Why are we getting seeing this change? Is because once you acquire human capital, no matter how bad, you know, you not you aspire for something completely different. It's knowledge, and you know, what are you going to do at home? So I think this idea. So India is going to see this transformation. That in India, the first law has been that labor force participation rate in India is quite low for women. And it has been the case that they withdraw from the labor force as their family income goes up. This is the emerging middle class. But as you graduate from the emerging middle class to the middle class, you're going to get, and that's another reason why you ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the compression of wages and lack of inflation uh, when they enter into the labor force. Um, one other aspect, uh, you know, about both China and India uh, is that, uh, you know, we kill the girl child before uh, she's born. Um, that, I imagine, is beginning to, it'll take another 10, 15 years, but that's another phenomenon that has gone on for 200 years, which is going to end. And why? It is the education. It's not as if the, the men are, you know, the society suddenly accepts. It's, it is the reality of education of the women themselves. They're not willing to accept second treatment. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it was Paul Krugman, or at least uh, among others, who, who said that a large part of the Southeast Asian economic miracle was due to the incorporation of women in the workforce, where they yeah. previously hadn't been. So yeah, kind of which hasn't like, happened in India. No, yeah. and it has happened in Singapore, it has happened in Thailand, it has yeah. happened in Malaysia. Yeah. And the, the effect on economic growth is quite startling, you know, yeah. and, and that's a large part of the, of the untold story of the yeah. economic miracle. One, one, sorry to um, just add on yeah. that, one of the studies that we did, which, uh, you know, to me it came as a big, big surprise. I worked with my wife who's a professor of sociology and has done a lot of work on the sex ratio, which is why you find me talking slightly intelligently about it. I work with it. But, you know, this insight came, we, we did a project for the UN on, on women and violence as well as the sex ratio. Um, so the idea was about look for how violence, uh, you know, against women. Now, violence against women is done by men. The other interesting statistic that came out is that 90% of all crimes in the world are committed by men. So here's another reason why the world in the future is going to be a lot better as the women get it. 90% of all crimes, kidnapping, theft, this, that, whatever. You know, so things are going to change. But it, yeah. Which of the crimes done by women? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. I think this will have to be the last question, I'm afraid. But um, yeah. yeah, it's more a suggestion than a question. So there, there are other folks who have, as you've mentioned, written about growth. But some of the recent uh, uh, books that are, you might want to think about how you would uh, confront their conclusions is, for example, the Poverty and Wealth of Nations, the book by uh, Johnson and Asamolu, which yeah, makes right. the argument that the distinction that one needs to draw isn't geography, it's uh, the nature of whether you have an, in, an institutional framework that's inclusionary yeah. or, or extractive. Yeah. From the standpoint of, of education being the, the catalyst, um, there's got to be a lag structure, right? I mean, mm. So if you're going to explain the growth of China and India in the last 40 years, right, what was it about that initial condition those 40 years ago right, that suddenly changed? Wasn't the change actually something about the institutional framework that China decided to put in place in 1978? Mm -hmm. And in the context in which there had been an investment in education in the previous regime, as opposed to education per se. Yeah. Then there's a book, sorry, by Dieter McCloskey called uh, uh, Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Doesn't Explain mm -hmm. Economic Growth, right? which is an argument that essentially says, look, the, the shift in, in attitudes had nothing to do with levels of education or levels of technology, it was the attitudes that people took towards, actu towards innovation and, and business that allowed for the 200-fold increase in incomes mm -hmm. that occurred in the 100 years in the countries which adopted that attitude towards the world. Yeah. You could argue that's linked to education, but it's also linked to, to uh, systems of values and that are at heart embedded ultimately yeah. in institutions. I can speak with no, no, very good suggestions on, on, on both of them. And as an economist and 
uh, you know, we have to go by <clears throat> the counterfactuals, can it explain certain phenomena? Now, let me address on the institutions part, Asamoglu, et cetera. Uh, and that, you know, uh, I explored in great, great depth in uh, my book, Devaluing to Prosperity, in 2012, uh, where there's a whole chapter on institutions and economic development. And essentially, I look at growth, uh, which is what they're trying to explain, and look at institutions, and in this case, uh, did the counterfactual or the other explanatory being undervaluation of exchange rate. You know that well. And um, it turns out that, you know, the institutions is about, in my uh, way of thinking, about the most spurious of all correlations uh, that have been put out. Now, uh, North got a Nobel Prize for it, et cetera, but we've seen how you can get Nobel Prizes for doing something. So I, I, don't, think there's a, the, I don't think there's any evidence to support. Uh, the, now, you were talking about whether something happened in China in uh, 1980 that changed the world. Well, let's start with the following. You know, at 1980, mid-80s, et cetera, there was this big belief um, that, uh, uh, you know, somehow democracies hindered growth, okay? And um, then it turned out, no, no I'll, and I'll come to the, the thing uh, quite explicitly. Um, and democracy hindered growth, and what you found out, that basically, including East Asia, etc., there was economic freedom that explained growth, and there are a long list of dictatorships in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa which didn't grow at all. Now coming explicitly to what happened then. You know, at the time, uh, and you were, the, we were sort of colleagues, though we didn't know, uh, in the early 90s uh, in Washington, um, you know, the study of challenge development, so what did we look at? We looked at Korea, that had already happened, spectacular. We looked at Indonesia, that had already happened. We looked at Thailand, all of this stuff. So there were several countries that had grown, and at that time, we didn't recognize. We thought there were some policies. And as I said, India, you know, you have a closed economy, you're not going to grow. So I'm taking that education even leads to a more open economy, hence those three conditions. So I think uh, I look at McCloskey's uh, work. Um, I, I know a little bit about it, but uh, I'm not in a position to talk firmly on it. Uh, maybe she has a point. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, it's going to be a hard sell to have an alternative explanation, uh, empirical one. Now, theoretical, you know, theoretical and also great economist Robert Gordon, who thinks that, uh, you know, we had there hasn't been any technological change, and he's a very, very esteemed uh, economist, and I know him well, and I admire him. So, you know, that's the nature of research. You look at research, you look at the same topic over and over again, and sometimes you come up with a different conclusion. So I think it'll be a long time before somebody can challenge Gary Becker, uh, a long, long time. Thank you. That's probably a very good place to end. Sorry, we've, I know there's a few more questions out there. Uh, as you can hear, Surya is positively fizzing with ideas. He keeps saying, I'll come to that later, and then he doesn't have time. So um, I'm sure he'll be around for a few minutes if, if yeah. you want to chat to him afterwards. But um, uh, we, we have to wrap up. But um, thank you so much indeed for a really yeah. interesting talk. Thank you. thank you very much. And remember, no such thing as bad publicity. You dislike something, give it a bad review. But... Uh, but write about it. <laughs> Thanks, though.